Stanford University. All right, uh, welcome back to CS193G. Uh, today we have another guest lecture. Uh, we have Bill Daly from Stanford and now the Chief uh, Research of Science Officer at NVIDIA here. Uh, Bill got uh, his PhD from Caltech, then was a professor at MIT where he built influential machines like the J machine and M machine, and then came to Stanford and did more work on real systems which really work, and both which are, include Imagine and High Performance um, Interconnection Network. And today he's going to be talking about the uh, rise of throughput computing and the future of computer architecture. Bill, take it away. Yeah, th thanks. So. Uh, um I'd like this to be a discussion, so if you guys have any questions, please um, do ask. I think it works much better if we have a, a dialogue um, rather, rather than if I just talk. It turns out that uh, once when I was supposed to give this lecture, I was planning to, uh, I thought I was scheduled on the second day of a workshop, and I was planning to do my slides on the first day, and they rearranged the schedule without telling me and put me on the first day, and so I wound up giving the talk with no slides at all, and people said it worked best that way because it had to be um, very interactive, so hopefully we won't use the slides as too much of a crutch. Um, what I'm going to talk about is really the future of GPUs, and that's really the future of all computing architecture, and I'll give you a, a bunch of reasons why that is. Um, this is the, the talk in a nutshell, so if you get things really quickly, you can just read this slide and then, and then leave early, because the rest of it's just going to be an elaboration on this. If you, if you remember nothing else about this talk, um, you should remember that um, going forward, all performance comes from parallelism. There's no other way to get performance these days than to do things in parallel. There's no magic way to make a serial processor go faster. In fact, the way we've been making serial processors go faster in the past is by doing parallelism under the covers and kind of hiding it. Um, the, the, the thing that I think is more critical and a lot of people miss out on is the fact that efficiency comes from locality. We're in a realm today where we're completely limited by power in what we can do with computing. Um, and this is from all scales, from things that you find in, in mobile devices um, to big supercomputers in machine rooms. It's entirely a power constrained problem. And all that really matters is um, you know, joules per operation, performance per watt. And it turns out that where most of the joules get burned up is in moving data around. And so efficiency to first approximation depends on locality, depends on moving data on the minimum distance possible. Well, it turns out if you look at the way we've been doing computing for, you know, the last 50 years since von Neumann sort of coined the um, architecture that bears his name in the 1940s, um, we've been using a model which is really in denial about both of these facts. It's been trying to get performance in ways other than parallelism, and in fact, it's been hiding the parallelism from you. It's in, been denying the fact that parallelism is going on. And it's been denying locality. It's been trying to hide locality from you under the guise of, of that there is a flat memory and caches will make everything good, which is just not true. It doesn't work in, in the general case, and it actually doesn't work in most cases. So we have these processors that are in denial about the two basic facts of life, parallelism and locality, um, what are we going to do going forward? We really have to abandon that model. We have to break with the past and move instead to processors that are optimized for, for parallelism and locality. I, I like to refer to these as throughput computers. Um, and I'm going to then talk about a class of throughput computers we've developed over the years, uh, both at Stanford and at NVIDIA, that, that I call stream processors, um, and then close with some uh, projections about the future of where GPU computing is going. So please do make this an interactive discussion. It'll be much more fun for both of us that way. Um, so single-threaded uh, processor performance is no longer scaling. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of people say that, that Moore's Law is dead. In fact, I recently wrote a, uh, an op-ed piece in Forbes magazine where I argue that Moore's Law is dead. Only part of Moore's, Moore's Law is dead. This part is actually still alive. So if you, if you go back and I actually encourage you guys to read Moore's original 1965 paper, you can get it off of the Intel website. I, I generally don't refer people to go to the Intel website. Uh, <laughs> but this is one thing that is actually worth reading there. Um, and if, if you look, what he predicts is that the number of transistors will double every year. Well, that was kind of optimistic, and so he was able, given the ability to go back and revise that to doubling every 18 months. Um, and he also predicts in here that um, because as you double the number of transistors, um, th think about going through two of these cycles where you have four times as many transistors. That means you've made the feature size half as much, right? And so through two of these cycles, you get four times as many transistors um, it turns out that because the feature sizes have as much, they go twice as fast. So you get eight times as much stuff on the chip, if you think of stuff as gate switching um, per second. Um, but, you, but it turns out that the energy of each of these switching events scaled for a long period of time as the cube of the feature size L. 
so that power stayed constant. You got eight times as much stuff for the same power. There's very few other things in life that are that good a deal. Um, so in this original paper, there was no prediction of processor performance. But over time, the popular view of Moore's law has come to be that um, sort of the food chain interpretation of Moore's law. Here's the food chain of computer architecture. Right, the process guys give us more transistors. We architects turn more transistors into more performance. The popular idea of Moore's law is that, gee, since the transistors are doubling every 18 months, the performance is going to double every 18 months. And in fact, the 1980s and 1990s were really good decades because through you know, the 80s and 90s, that worked. Um, you'd, you'd get more transistors, you'd turn it into more serial performance, and um, you know, you'd, you'd become a hero by taking your old code, putting it on the new machine, and it would run twice as fast. Um, and, and that actually delivered more value, right? So there's the application writers, um, who probably are most of you guys, that actually you know, close this food chain. It turns out the people nearest to the end of the food chain get fed the best. Um, but um, something happened along the way. And, and so these are charts that when I did them, they were predictions. Um, so these are charts from a, uh, an ISAT study. It's a DARPA panel that I chaired in 2001 called The Last Classical Computer, where we looked at factors affecting uh, computer scaling and our observation is the reason why the 80s and 90s were really good decades is you could take this 52% per year, that's doubling approximately every 18 months, and break it down into three compound growth factors. Um, you got about 20% per year, 19%, from faster gates. Think of that as picoseconds per gate. By the way, one of these days I should flip this chart over, but I originally did it this way, so I'm keeping with that. Here, lower is better. This is performance in units of picoseconds per instruction. So you know, lower is better. If you invert that, um, it, it, the units become gigaflops, excuse me, um, teraflops, um, or tera instructions per second. Um, so um, we're getting 20% faster gates, but our clock rate was going, going up faster than that, and that's because in addition to faster gates, um, we were collapsing our pipelines. If you go back to 1980 and look at the original Intel 8086, um, it had about um, 100 NAND gates per clock stage. So you'd sort of go through 100 gate delays and then tick clock into a register, 100 gate delays, tick clock into a register. Um, at the peak of where things got really crazy with the Intel Pentium 4, which happened you know, around 2000, 2001, um, they had nine gate delays per clock cycle and they actually double clocked their arithmetic unit. So it was really four and a half. Um, and that, that was um, insanely fast. In fact, they have since backed off. The sweet spot today is somewhere between 16 and 25 gate delays per clock cycle because that's an energy efficient um, point to operate. So we're not scaling gates per clock cycle anymore. That one is mined out. And think of this as, you know, that was a vein with good, you know, good ore in it. We mined all the gold out of that vein. It's gone. Can't do that one again. Um, the other thing we were doing is mining instruction level parallelism, which you can think of as clocks per instruction. Remember, all performance comes from parallelism. Um, the original Intel 8086 back in 1980 took 10 clock cycles to do one instruction. You did one instruction at a time. For 10 cycles, you went on, you did the next instruction. They overlapped fetching an instruction with executing the next one, but the execution was entirely one instruction at a time and took many cycles. Um, the, um, by the end of the um, 90s, um, there, there were machines that were issuing as many as six instructions per cycle. The average of the very high-end machines was probably about four instructions per cycle, and we are still there. That vein is mined out as well. So you've mined out the clocks per instruction. You've mined out the gates per clock. What's left is this 20% per year in faster gates. But something else happened um, around 2005 where um, because of um, leakage, we no longer scaled voltage. And then we actually started optimizing the transistors different where even this has gone away. And in fact, now, depending on whose estimates you look at, it's either zero or 5% per year. The serial processors have basically flatlined. There's no more growth there. Now, it's interesting because you know, back in, in the 1980s when I was on the faculty at MIT, I was predicting that the whole world was going to become parallel um, because it was clearly the only model of computation that was going to work. And I was right, but I was a little bit wrong about when. And, and the reason I was wrong about when is I'd say, you guys, you know, I'd go into some you know, big oil company or something and say, you guys should just completely rewrite your code in my new parallel language. And we had a bunch of new parallel language we'd invented at MIT at that point in time, the concurrent small talk and concur concurrent aggregates. Um, and uh, the reason you should rewrite your code is because then you can ride this wonderful green line. And I have to say that I was not working for NVIDIA when I chose the colors for these lines. Um, where where you know, your performance will scale at 74% per year, 
because you're going to get um, all of these new transistors that Moore's Law gives you, you turn into linear speed up, you get more parallel processors, and they clock faster each year. So you're converting both the number of devices and the improvement in clock rate into more performance. And they would say, that's very nice, but that 22% per year isn't worth throwing away our billion lines of code that we happen to have sitting around. The, the, you know, the, the pain is too large for the, for the benefit that's going to be realized from that. Um, and so years went by, years went by, and the dominant, except in some very high-end application areas, the dominant um, uh, programming paradigm was serial until we hit this deviation point here where it's split. And no longer is it you know, a 22% per year difference. And by the way, you may not even realize all of this because this assumes perfect linear speed up, which you may not get. But now the gap is growing at you know, in excess of 50% per year. Now it's an interesting thing to do to go parallel. And in fact, the first approximation um, if you go back to that food chain, the only way you get more performance, which is what then application people can turn into more value, is by getting on the green line. This is flattened out. So all, all new interesting applications in the future are parallel applications. Now to show that these, you know, so these are charts that I drew in 2001 predicting what was going to happen. And of course my credibility predicting was sort of in question because I'd been predicting the whole world was going to go parallel for 20 years at that point. Um, but um, it, it turns out that this one really did happen. This is a chart out of the latest edition of, of Hennessy and Patterson Computer Architecture, a quantitative approach. And they show a flattening out to less than 20% per year. The dot, dashed red line is 20% per year. The blue dots there are, are somewhat less than that. And I actually now have, thanks to, to Mark Horowitz, the data points um, out through 2009. And it is, is more like 5 to 10% out, out in that realm. It has flattened out um, even more than that. So single thread performance is no longer scaling. The only way you get performance is by having parallelism. Okay? So that's one thing that, that, that modern processors, modern CPUs are in denial about. The other thing really has to do with locality. And to understand locality, you have to understand um, some, something about um, energy on chips. So chips today are power limited. We could put more stuff on a chip than we could power. If we filled our chip completely up with arithmetic units and connected them up to memory arrays, um, our chip would melt. But the interesting thing is that if we fill them up with arithmetic units and just clock the arithmetic units, they won't melt because um, we're doing things entirely locally. The energy consumed there is pretty small. So, so the reason this is happening, um, we have to go back to another semi-log plot drawn by Gordon Moore. Um, so he, I guess he really likes semi-log plots because, you know, almost 40 years later in 2003, he comes back and he gives a keynote address um, at ISSCC um, where he makes um, this observation that these two lines are about to collide with one another. Your question, yeah? Before we lose the thread, what do you mean by most power spent moving the data? Do you have some breakdown like percentage in DRAM, percentage in DRAM bus? Um, I don't have that breakdown, but what I have in about three slides, hold on a second here, I've got the preview view here. Um, four slides, I will show you the energy taken to do arithmetic operations, to move data small distances on chip, large distances on chip, and to move it off chip, and you will see what I mean. So if you'll hold that thought for four slides, we'll, we'll be there. Okay. Well, can you just, for those who don't know, elaborate what leakage is in terms of you know, normal transistors? Sure, yeah. So, so uh, the, the way to think about this chart is that um, there's, there's really two sources of, of power dissipation on modern chips. Um, there's what they dissipate when nothing is happening, and that's leakage. So the way to think about it is you build your chip with gates. It's really unfortunate that you can't use the board and the screen at the same time in here. Um, is there any way to make the screen go up quickly? Oh, for, forget it. Out. Um, I just do my shit. Okay. Well, I really like this a voice recognition system. That's good enough. I can probably just do it right here. Yo. Okay. So. Um, the, the way to think about it is that when we switch one of these NAND gates, you know, we talked about you know, how the, you get four times as many every um, roughly three years. Um, the way to think about a lot of the power on our chip is it's dynamic power. It's power that's spent charging and discharging capacitors through the supply voltage. Right? So we have our gate here. We connect it up to the supply voltage, VDD. Um, and it charges this capacitance of its out, output wire in the gate of whatever it's fanning out to. Call that C. And the energy of, of switching this is CV squared. That's the switching energy. Um, and historically, as we scaled gate length, we also scaled the supply voltage. So the V squared part scaled. 
and we scaled the, the capacitance um, basically because you have a, you think of a parallel plate capacitor, you're scaling all three dimensions, right? And so it, it turns out that it's this times this over this. And so two of them cancel out and you get another um, L out of that. And so ESW is proportional to L cubed until about 2005. And the reason we stopped doing this in 2005 is it turns out that these gates also draw some current, the leakage current, whether they are switching or not. So you think you're being very clever, you have a unit you're not using, you, you gate the clock to that unit. This is you know, called clock gating. It's a common um, power conservation technique. But even when it's not switching, it leaks. And the leakage here is an exponential function. The, um, the leakage current is proportional to um, the threshold voltage, which is a parameter that you can actually set anywhere you want. When you buy chips from TSMC, um, one of the things in the paperwork that you send them when you um, place the order, paperwork, I'm saying figuratively, it's all done electronically, is um, specifying um, uh, values for, for threshold voltage. You can actually specify three or four of these depending on, on the process. But typically you'll scale this as a fraction of VDD, often one third of VDD um, for the threshold voltage. Well, because as we were scaling, you can, you can flip back to this chart now, because we were scaling um, the uh, feature size, and we're scaling this threshold voltage, and this leakage is varying exponentially with the threshold voltage, the leakage is increasing really rapidly, so that it came out of something where people never even worried about it until the mid-90s, to the fact that these two lines hit in, in the early part of, of the last decade. And when it hit, the thing that you had to do is stop scaling voltage, or instead of, you know, instead of having the leakage be you know, you know, a third or, or a half of the power dissipation on the chip, it would be 99%. Your chips would be many thousands of watts and, and uh, you would be unhappy. So in the good old days, we had what people called constant field or Denard scaling of, of semiconductors. Denard because a guy named um, Denard at IBM wrote the classic paper um, that developed this theory, which is basically every time you cut the feature size in half, L goes to L prime, this is half of what it used to be. You'd cut the voltage in half. This switching energy E becomes eighth of what it was. You crank the clock frequency up by a factor of two because now the electrons have half the distance to go to get across a transistor. Um, you can put four times as much stuff on the chip, so the density in gates per square millimeter goes up to four times what it was, and the power stays the same. You got eight times as much stuff, four times as many gates going twice as fast for the same power, and life was good. Um, and now things are a little bit more complicated. And what's changed in current scaling is the second line here. Now V is constant. We're holding you know, voltage at, at essentially one volt. And we've done it for many generations. It used to be every time you got a, a finer line technology, you'd have a new supply voltage. The 0.18 micron parts ran at 1.8 volts. And we moved to 0.13 micron parts. They ran at 1.3 volt. Then we went to 90 nanometer parts and they ran at one volt and 65 nanometer parts ran at one volt and 40 nanometer parts run at one volt. 28 nanometer parts run at one volt. There's a pattern here. We've, we've flattened out. The voltage is no longer scaling. And because of that, we, our energy hasn't stopped scaling, but now it's scaling by a factor of two each generation instead of a factor of eight. And that's a big difference. So now if we basically double our clock frequency and we quadruple our density, our power will go up by a factor of four. We can't tolerate that. Um, so we are limited by, by power. But let's take a look at, at where that power goes. And this gets back to your question. So as an architect, I consider myself an artist. And my canvas is a 20 millimeter um, by 20 millimeter chunk of, of silicon these days in, in, uh, in, in 28 nanometer. But I'm going to use 40 nanometer numbers because they're what I happen to have on these slides. Um, and um, the, the, this is not to scale, by the way. This is really kind of like that. Um, but um, I should say it's, 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 not, it's not actual size. Uh, but to scale on this not actual size thing, this is the size of a 64-bit fused multiply add unit. In fact, on Fermi, it's, a, it's a 0.084 um, millimeter squared, which I've rounded to 0.1. And it consumes about 50 picojoules per op, 100 picojoules to do a fused multiply add. I mean, I can run it at 1.5 gigahertz. Um, so one thing I could do with this chip, if you think about it, I've got um, 400 square millimeters. It takes a tenth of a square millimeter to do a fused multiply at. I could put 4,000 of these on the chip. Um, now, if I put 4,000 of these on, on the chip um, and I run it at, at you know, 1.5 gigahertz, that gives me, what is it, something like um, 12 teraflops um, on, on one chip. 
Um, and if you actually work the energy numbers out, um, it's 12 teraflops for 300 watts, um, which while high is actually sort of on the hairy edge of doability. So I can actually fill my whole chip with floating point units, clock it at full rate, get 12 teraflops out of it, and it works, but it's completely worthless because arithmetic units are a lot like kids and pets in that they're easy to acquire, but they're difficult to feed and deal with the things that they produce. So with, with, with arithmetic units, um, you, you have to feed them an instruction in several operands each cycle, and they produce a result that you then have to put somewhere. So what do you do with um, these, op these pesky operands? Well, the way to think about it is you have to move them across the die somewhere, right? And so, you know, it takes me 50 picojoules to do a 64-bit floating point operation. Um, if I want to move one 64-bit word one millimeter, that takes 25 picojoules. So if I'm doing a fuse multiply add that takes three input operands and produces one output operand, that's 100 picojoules to move the operands, even if they come from only one millimeter away. That's as much energy as doing, as doing the fuse multiply add. Um, if I have to move them 10 millimeters away, now I'm spending 10 times as much energy moving the data as I, as I did doing the operation. Um, if I need to move them off chip, um, now it's 40 times as much energy, right? And, and by the way, um, reading a word out of, out of a DRAM is, is something more like, um, like another order of magnitude above this. It, it's something on the order of 10 nanojoules per word. I'm not going to try to do that calculation in my head real time. That's 20 nanojoules per word to read it from the, uh, from the DRAM. So, what you get the idea is, is we can fill our chip with floating point units and clock it at full rate and it won't melt only if they're reading their operands from like, you know, 100 microns away or less. As soon as they have to go even a millimeter to get stuff, now the chip melts. And if the stuff is even global on chip, it will melt 10 times over. If I go off chip, it's going to melt 100 times over. Um, so the, the, the thing to take away from this is that chips are power limited. Most power is moving data. And what I mean here is that um, you, the break-even point is at about a millimeter, right? If you're moving data farther than a millimeter, you're, you're burning more energy moving the data than you are doing double precision floating point operations. For single precision, by the way, that comes down to about a third of a millimeter because those are cheaper operations. And for integer, it comes down to about 100 microns. Um, so efficiency is locality. So first part of the talk, summary. Performance is parallelism. Efficiency is locality. I could have skipped a lot of slides and just cut right to this. Um, so, so the good news is that applications have both of these. Um, the codes may not, but the applications do. Um, so if you look at scientific applications, they have large data sets. This means lots of parallelism. So in some response to my um, op-ed in Forbes, where I basically conclude again that the world has to go parallel, but this time um, it's happening. The time is right. Um, this guy in Ars Technica writes this thing saying, uh, Moore's Law isn't dead, it's just pining for the fjords. And his conclusion is, there are no parallel applications. All applications are really serial. He, he's just broken. I didn't even see a sense of glorifying that with a response. Because um, you, you look at scientific applications, and you have huge data sets. You've got, you know, often we're looking at a lot of these fluids codes that have billions of cells. And they tend to have two parts to the code. They have a part where you kind of walk over the cells and you sort of apply the constituent equations per cell. And that is a billion-fold parallelism. Each cell is essentially independent of one another. And then you have a solution method, where if it's an explicit solution method, it's still a billion-fold parallelism. You're kind of evolving, evolving the state independently of each cell. But even for an implicit method, you know, it, the, the parallelism is reduced as there's a global communication step that kind of dominates. But it's still an extremely um, parallel operation. Now, as we move forward, um, people are becoming more clever with their applications. And this means uh, two things. One is that they're becoming increasingly irregular. Even in the codes we had for um, the, the Merrimack streaming supercomputer, we found that 20% um, of all our memory references were irregular gather scatters. Um, dense matrices are becoming less frequent. Um, and so you need to have efficient ability to do, you know, you know what, what I'll call sort of non-coherent memory references, doing gathers and scatters over, over parts of the machine. Um, and the models are becoming increasingly complex. And this is a good thing because it means that you sort of, you know, pull in, you know, 20 to, to 100 floating point words that represent the state of one of these cells. You know, depending on how many different you know, chemical species you're tracking um, in there and, and the different variables you have. But then you run a thousand flops calculating all sorts of bizarre things about it. And as the models get more um, complex, um, a, a term that I refer to as the arithmetic intensity goes up, which is the ratio of the arithmetic operations you do to the words of bandwidth you need out of, out of global memory. And so, so life gets better in, in that respect. Um, now, the global solutions are sometimes bandwidth limited. If you're basically um, 
doing a, a, a sparse matrix vector multiply, which is a core operation of doing a conjugate gradient or conjugate residual solution if you have an implicit method. You basically do a global memory reference, and then you do one multiply and one add and never you know, look at that again. Um, and that, you know, if you look at the way these machines are balanced, you are at that point entirely global memory bandwidth limited. But, um, so there's less locality in these, in these phases, but overall there's still plenty of parallelism and plenty of locality in these scientific applications. And since I'm actually a little bit behind my uh, schedule for this lecture, just trust me that embedded applications have the same properties. So, um, performance is parallelism, efficiency is locality. Fortunately, most applications have lots of, of both. And so people at this point in talk always say, well, Professor Daly, Professor Daly, what about Amdahl's law? Well, first of all, it's not really a law, right? A law is something like F equal MA. You know, it's not just a good idea, but it really happens. You, you can't violate that one, um, at, least, at least not at reasonable velocities. Um, and, um, you know, Amdahl's law doesn't apply to future applications. It was an observation made in 1967 about the applications they had at the time. And those applications tended to have things called serial fractions. If you look at our codes today, they tend to, be, they tend to have what people call hammock-type parallelism, where they have places where there is a billion-fold parallelism, and there are places where it's merely 10,000-fold. But it very, very rarely goes down to one, except maybe at the very beginning and the very end of the code. If you structure your codes right, there's parallelism through the whole thing. So to, to summarize right now, um, you know, uh, performance is parallelism, efficiency is locality, so what do you need to exploit these? If you want to build an efficient machine today, what do you need? Well, for parallelism, you want a lot of processors. And in fact, you want a lot of efficient processors. This is why it's, it's actually a really dumb idea to build a parallel machine by taking these processors that were optimized for single thread performance and putting them together. Because they're not efficient. If you look at a, a, um, you know, a core i7, it dissipates about 2 nanojoules for every instruction it executes. If you look at a Fermi, it dissipates about 200 picojoules for every instruction it executes. That 10x in energy efficiency is a huge advantage. It means you can put 512 cores on the chip instead of eight. Um, and so you're much better off exploiting parallelism having many efficient cores rather than a few inefficient cores, especially since you're ultimately limited by the power budget in your machine room. Um, and then you want, for locality, an exposed storage hierarchy. You want to be able to see um, what data is near your, your cores and operate on that data. And of course, then you want a programming system that abstracts this, so you can write your codes easily and, and move them from machine to machine. Yeah? I mean, it, it, I mean, it exposes, it exposes the entire key to the storage locality. I mean, I don't see the connection of these two things. Well, if you, if you expose the storage hierarchy, then the programmer, for example, can decide to stage some data into shared memory and operate out of shared memory, which, which is a very efficient way of operating. If you don't expose it, if you give the, the programmer a mental model that the world is flat, that all memory is equal, then the programmer won't really have a motivation to, to try to reference a small working set that it can keep in a local store. Or even if the programmer is clever enough to see through the fact that your machine is in denial about locality, it's given you this flat memory model, but in fact it's got a cache, and he's going to try to block his code for that cache, you don't have the degree of control. You can wind up interfering words out of that cache and not getting the locality you want. By exposing the storage hierarchy, you make it much easier to capture things in a memory close to the ALUs and get mo more of the energy going into doing productive work and less of it moving data around. Uh, yeah? Well, most people would say that exposing the IRD makes programming a bit more difficult, right? So would you see that to really um, get this parallelism um, to the best of our ability? You have to kind of give up some kind of ability? Is that straight out? Have to be yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's a usual case where, um, you know, it, it certainly it's certainly an easier model to think that the world is flat. And so if you can get a level of performance that you're happy with, with the world is, you know, with the flat memory space model, then, then that's probably where you should stop. And so I think, th and this is why we build our GPUs the way that we do, in that on, on Fermi, for example, we have L1 and L2 caches. And so you can choose to just make memory references into device memory space, right, and pull things out of the L1 and L2 um, caches. And if that gives you a level of performance you're happy with, you're done, right? And then if, but if you do want to optimize your code, um, what you want to do is to have the ability for a programmer to, to conveniently you know, see what's really going on inside the machine and then optimize with that. And so if you want to do that then, um, you can decide that you're going to map some of your data structures in, into shared, right? And then you, you know, copy things into there and operate out of them. And there you're controlling what is in a local memory right next to the processor and not having to sort of count on a cache system to capture that locality for you. So you want both. You want you know, sort of a flat view of the world for convenience, 
but then when the programmer wants to optimize, you don't want them to have to do it in spite of automatic mechanisms that are kind of getting in the way. Yeah. So what we'd really like to, to see our machines as is, is tree-structured machines. And so for some reason, I think because when we were monkeys, we hung upside down by our tails, we tend to draw these trees with the roots at the top. Um, but but the, the goal here is, is um, that we have a bunch of processors, each with their own sort of private L1 caches, some network that hooks a bunch of those up to an L2, network to an L3, and so on, up to you get to some you know, global shared memory up, up at the top. Now, the, the advantage of, of organizing these things as trees and then making these levels explicit um, is that by explicitly um, you know, managing this, this data, we can make a much better use of it um, than trying to do it uh, reactively, as, as in the case of a cache. And so th these are some results from um, the Stanford Merrimack project. Um, one of the key applications uh, for Merrimack was it was a code called Stream Fem, which was written by um, Tim Barth at NASA. And it actually had something like 50 kernels in it. But here's sort of a cartoon version of it with five kernels that sort of captures the essence of, of, of what was going on. And basically, for, for every cell, um, gathered faces and gathered elements, computed the flux in that cell, um, then basically saved that flux out, and then per cell um, gathered you know, the flux from all of the faces um, and then computed what was going on inside the cell and advanced the cell and basically integrated forward to the next state, um, taking the uh, current set of elements, advancing to the new set of elements. Um, and when you look at this stream program, um, there's a couple things going on here. One is that there's producer-consumer locality. I'm computing the flux through a whole bunch of faces here. Um, I can immediately from that compute the numerical flux, and that's all I need to save. So this flux that was computed never has to land in global address space. It can, it can live in, in the on-chip memory and die there um, without ever getting materialized. So that's some global memory references that never had to, had to happen. Um, and, and if you look at the way a cache system works, if I write that to, a, to an address, if I basically allocated some array, you know, array you know, flux, um, and I write it, even though it's dead, um, the, the cache has no way of knowing it's dead. And it's going to go ahead and write it back when it replaces that cache line and burn, burn valuable memory bandwidth and valuable energy doing that write back. The other thing is that I can anticipate for the things I have to fetch out of memory, the face geometry, you know, the cell orientations, when I'm reading the numerical flux into the next little bit of the pipe, I can anticipate when I need those before I need them and stage the memory transfers so that I'm managing my on-chip memory like a good warehouse manager. I want to do just-in-time inventory control. I don't want to pull this data in too soon because you sort of measure space um, in this warehouse as byte cycles. This is a, a chart with cycles going vertically and bytes going horizontally. If I load some data in too soon, I'm putting a big footprint in this byte cycle space. Um, if I load the data in too late, it's a really small footprint, but now I'm idling the, the processor, and that's an even worse thing um, to do. But if I have a good model of, of the latency of my memory system, I can stage things just in time. Then I can also, um, with an auto-tuner, um, set the sizes of these block transfers, essentially the um, the, the blocking sizes of this computation to exactly use all of my on-chip memory with live data. Um, it turns out if you try to do this with a cache, you usually wind up at a tiny fraction of the cache size because as you start getting to using all of the cache um, in a blocking factor, the interference starts killing you. Um, so, so we're able to, and, and there are a bunch of studies here where we showed we could reduce the off-chip bandwidth by something on, on a factor of three on this application by explicitly managing these transfers and by forwarding um, data with producer-consumer lo locality from one to the other. Um, and by doing this proactively, we're able to keep both pipes busy most of the time. So the blue here is the activity of the arithmetic units. Um, the white is um, the activity on the memory system side. And you see there are places we become memory limited and we basically bubble the arithmetic units. Um, and then there are places where we are arithmetic limited. But we try to load balance out, out the pipeline by very um, aggressive scheduling. And it's it's, it's wonderful because you can apply all sorts of interesting results from operations research to schedule these things in the compiler. Whereas at runtime, you're down to, you know, what can I do in a few gates? And you just can't be very sophisticated about um, what you do then. The other thing about making all this stuff predictable is once you get it all loaded into on-chip memory, and, and I have to confess that our stream processors were a little bit too strict about this. Um, they, they basically said you have to get everything into on-chip memory, then you fire your kernel off. Whereas uh, the GPUs are much more flexible, and they say, get what you can into the shared memory, fire your kernels off, but you can also do main memory references. And if they take a cache miss, we'll just switch to another thread. Um, but, but both of these give you a very simple and predictable model, and this means that you can then use the compiler to schedule the pipeline. This is the inner loop of the, uh, 
um, compute cell interior kernel, which was one of those kernels on the previous slide. Um, and this is, um, this is actually backwards. This is one iteration of it. You'll see it does some long latency operations at first. Those um, frames are, are things where it's idle, and then it actually picks up here, and it's pretty arithmetically intense down to the bottom. The compiler uses a, a technique called software pipelining, where it takes three of these iterations, folds them on each other, sort of schedule, co-schedules them, and that produces this code, which keeps the arithmetic units busy something like 95% of the time with, with very simple control. Um, and this basically is taking advantage of the fact that if you look at where most of the complexity comes from in in CPUs, why they're two nanojoules per instruction is because they're, they're trying to deal with unpredictable memory latency, right? If you can stage the memory latency by using a good scheduler to get most of what you need into your um, explicitly managed storage hierarchy before you fire things off, right? Then with very simple control, you can get really high throughput. Um, and you don't need to have speculation and out of order execution, all the things that make CPUs inefficient processors to achieve good performance. And so this is really what we call stream processors. They're things with lots of efficient execution units and um, um, explicitly managed on, on chip memory. So um, they actually started here at Stanford in, in the mid 90s with a project called Imagine um, that had 48 32-bit floating point units on it in 0.18 micron technology. Merrimack, I'm showing you a floor plan because the Department of Energy never funded the construction of it, but it was, it was designed down to the RTL level and had um, 16 clusters, each of which had four double precision FMA units. So 128 um, double precision units, depending on, on how you count them. Storm One is a commercial version of Imagine. It was produced by a, uh, a company called Stream Processors, founded by a couple of my former graduate students. It was really an integer version of Imagine doubled. So whereas Imagine had eight clusters, um, it had 16, but they had 32-bit uh, integer units rather than 32-bit um, floating point. We count cell as a stream processor because it has all the properties. It has um, you know, you know, a large number of efficient arithmetic units, eight SPEs, four wide each, so 32 um, floating point units. Um, and these local stores are explicitly managed on chip memory. And it's a good lesson of how to make something hard to program uh, because it, it didn't have the easy way of looking at the memory. And of course, the right way to build a stream processor is as a GPU. Um, I, I should have put a Fermi picture up here. I need, need to update this, this slide deck. Yeah, but Fermi has 512 um, CUDA cores, and um, e each of the um, SMs, which is a group of 32 of those, um, um, has a, uh, um, a uh, shared memory that can be configured as 64K shared, si or 48 shared 16 um, L1, or, or the other way around. Um, what are we doing on time here? How, do I, how long do I go to? Is it 5.30? 5.30. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me uh, s skip over you know, some of the details of Merrimack and talk about the application results because um, they're kind of interesting and they say a lot about the, this issue of parallelism and, and locality. Um, so here are, are a bunch of the applications we had. StreamFem was this um, um, finite element code. Um, Stream molecular dynamics is actually an adaptation of, of Gromax, a molecular dynamics code. Um, StreamFlow um, was a, a, a regular uh, matrix fluids code. Um, CDP is... Um, uh, another another fluids code more irregular, um, and then these are sort of a bit of you know kernels, DGEM, convolution, FFT. Um, stream spas is is a sparse matrix vector um, multiplies the sparse matrix package we had here. Um, so they're developed in a bunch of different languages, and you'll see compiled in languages. And this is the power of graduate students, uh, because the the application writers would say, I want to write in Fortran, but we didn't have a stream compiler for Fortran, so it was a graduate student that made the step from Fortran um, to, to Stream C. Stream C was the language that most of these we're compiling because that was what our, our compiler tools were. There was actually something called a, a meta compiler that converted Brook to Stream C. And that, that really, for the, for the two benchmarks up here that are in Brook, is what um, took place. So Stream C is really C with a couple, um, uh, you know, a couple words added on for streams and kernels to allow you to, um, to sort of tack together kernels in a C program. Um, Brook is a language that's actually still being used by AMD today that came out of the Merrimack project, was largely developed by Ian Buck. Um, here at Stanford, um, which was really taking StreamC and trying to abstract it. StreamC exposed it a little bit too much of the machine underneath. Um, but uh, as I'll get to when I talk about Sequoia later, there's a scene in the movie Back to the Future where the professor says you're thinking too three-dimensionally. It was really clear that in Brook we were thinking too one-dimensionally. And it, you, know, you had to make everything into a stream, which was this linear sequence of data. And when you're dealing with a three- or four-dimensional data structure, that's not the way you think about the problem. So we were constantly using these things called stream operators to jam three or four dimensions into one dimension. And it, it made the, 
the model less clean than, well, this is a weird screen, it's got need to be some dampening on it. Um, um, but the, uh, the interesting thing here is that we sustained a relatively large fraction of, of peak performance and, and, uh, on these applications. And we made comparisons um, to a Pentium 4. And this is really a very unfair comparison because this was, um, the, the Merrimack number was um, a processor that was designed in a, um, a, a TSMC sta 90 nanometer standard cell library by four graduate students. And it was designed down to having placed and routed results for these um, arithmetic clusters. And so it ran at a speed of one gigahertz, which is actually pretty good for four graduate students. The Pentium 4 was, I think, one technology generation ahead, was full custom design by something like 1,500 Intel engineers. Um, and as a result, it ran at 3.6 gigahertz. So you, it had a 3.6 to 1 clock advantage. Uh, but Merrimack still beat it by typically about a factor of, of, of 15 to 20 in speed up. And in efficiency, it was more like 35 to 40. Now, the places where that doesn't hold um, were in stream CDP and in stream SPAs because both of those wound up being bandwidth limited. They were essentially doing sparse matrix vector um, multiplies. And that was and the memory bandwidth to do that was dominating. But even on those, they came out ahead. I don't know why I don't have the CDP numbers here. They came out ahead. The reason they came out ahead is that doing the stream scheduling let you keep the memory interface busy. So even though the memory bandwidth was the same, we were able to get more out of it. Question over here? Yeah, uh, I thought, you say Merrimack was the one that didn't get built? Yes. So how, how do you compare, how? Uh, we had a cycle accurate simulator. So we were able to run codes on it and measure the performance, measure the energy, right? Um, we just, could, you just, you just had to be very patient because the slowdown factor was to do one cycle of Merrimack, which you know, was going to run at a gigahertz, um, would take about, you could run that at about 10 kilohertz. So there was you know, so, something like 100,000 to one slowdown factor of simulating it. Um, and and the, the reason we were able to get that efficiency is, is, with, um, is because we were able to capture locality. This is the bandwidth hierarchy uh, for these applications. Um, and again, we've got the sustained flops here. And, and if they don't match, it's because I may have been pulling these from two different versions of, of Merrimack. The project evolved, and I grabbed slides from a bunch of different talks. What you see is that, with the exception of um, stream spas and stream CDP, the bulk of the operations, well over 95% of all operands, came out of these local register files sitting right next to the floating point units. Most, most of the rest came out of what's called the stream register file, which is a unit that's sort of you know, one step away and very little stuff was going out to memory, typically less than 2%, except for these two that were memory bandwidth limited because there's just a fundamental aspect of, of the algorithm. Um, so let's move a little bit to, to GPU computing today and in the future. Um, so here's, here's sort of a cartoon of Fermi, and it is very much a throughput computer. We've got lots of efficient cores, 512 efficient cores, and a rich storage hierarchy with um, various levels of memory. I think you had a whole lecture on Fermi, so I'm gonna skip through these pretty quickly. Um, so um, the, the big message here is to avoid denial, right? Um, step one is to admit, uh, admit things, including you have a problem. And single thread processors ignore these things. Um, they deny parallelism. They try to pretend they have serial execution. So they spend an enormous amount of valuable power um, using instruction level parallelism and then hiding it from you. And this is very inefficient and very limited scalability. You're much better off making that parallelism explicit um, and, and then exploiting it. And then the flat memory model really denies locality, which prevents you from really staging your, your data properly um, through the memory hierarchy. Um, so given that we're not going to be in denial about parallelism or locality, um, how do we want to program things? Um, so, so the notion of stream programming is something that, that really started with the, uh, the Imagine project. And the idea was that you got a lot of parallelism. You got data parallelism because each one of these streams, they really need some shock absorbers on the screen. Each one of these streams um, is typically, you know, many uh, millions of elements which you typically will block into chunks that are maybe 100 to 1,000 elements at a time. There's then parallelism between kernels. You can run multiple kernels um, in a pipeline fashion or multiple kernels in parallel across the machine. And then there's instruction level parallelism within the kernels. Um, there's lots of locality here, a lot of locality within the kernels. And also the producer-consumer locality here typically would allow you to um, block um, the execution of one of these kernels. So it would execute just enough to produce um, intermediate elements along these streams to fill the local storage. And then you'd run the downstream nodes and compute that out of the local storage and never have to promote this data out to a higher level of the memory hierarchy. And there's this 
you know, sort of scheduling to optimize local storage use, which is really the essence of stream, stream scheduling. There's a PhD thesis written on that topic. Um, and then the predictability of having all of this data you needed when you fired the kernel off enabled very simple control to schedule the arithmetic units very effectively. Um, so, so like many things, it took a, took a decade for this really to come to fruition. In 1997, we threw together a language very quickly called Stream C, um, Kernel C, which was really just a very straightforward extension of C to let you um, write stream programs. Uh, in fact, it was basically C with the keywords kernel and stream added onto it. Um, in, in 2002, um, we uh, developed the Brook language, which tried to um, um, abstract that. So things like knowing how many lanes wide the machine was, which was visible in Stream C, was not visible in Brook. It abstracted that out. Um, but it was really too one-dimensional. Um, and so in, in 2005, I don't know why I put 2007 up here. I think it was really in 2005 when um, you know, uh, Kayvon Fatali and a, a graduate student of Pat Hanrahan's came to me and he said, you know, the, the essence of a kernel isn't that it takes a linear stream in and produces a linear stream out. It's that all of its operands are local, and it operates on those local operands, produces a result, and then you scatter that, that result back. Um, and so we, we generalized the notion of kernels, which are these things that take streams in and produce streams out, to tasks. And, and we basically said there are two types of tasks. Um, there are um, inner tasks that basically do a parameterized decomposition of your problem. They take a big instance of your problem and make a smaller instance of your problem. So they can take a big instance in one level of the memory hierarchy and make a number of smaller instances in a lower level of the memory hierarchy and then tack those together into the global solution going the other way. And then when you get down to the bottom of the memory hierarchy, you have a leaf task, which is like a kernel. It basically takes local inputs and produces local results um, and um, hence operates very predictably and very efficiently operating out of local storage. There's no uh, uh, unpredictable memory latencies to hide. And all the machine-specific details were factored out. In fact, they were factored out into a number of um, um, variables we called tunables that an auto-tuner could then set. Um, so CUDA is very much a stream language. You guys have been playing with it a lot, I guess. Um, you have explicit control of the memory hierarchy with shared, um, which is also the means for communication between the, the threads of the CTA. You can do transfers of data up and down the hierarchy. It's a little bit awkward. We really should have block transfer units, but right now we're doing it with loads and stores, but it still works. Um, and we operate on data with kernels. Um, but the thing which is a real improvement, if you, if you ever wrote a program in Stream C or in, or in Sequoia, the thing which makes life much easier in CUDA is that I can take an arbitrary pointer and dereference it right in the middle of a CUDA kernel, which I couldn't do. It, you know, the, the, stream, the various Stanford stream languages were all very rigid about memory accesses. The only thing you could access within a kernel were, was, was local stores. So I'm going to skip over the examples a little bit because I want to get to the future of computing, um, and I'm way behind because you guys have seen lots of examples. So we'll come on, skip over these. Um, I will talk a little bit about, about, um, about Sequoia. So I, I basically said that the, the notion here, I want to just make sure I do have time for the future part. How far is the future part in the future? Um, pretty close. Um, so the notion of Sequoia is that if you take something like matrix multiply, you write two, two tasks. You write an inner task and a leaf task. Um, and you don't specify the size of each level of the memory hierarchy or even how many levels there are. Um, when, when you compile the, the Sequoia program, say you're compiling, um, in this case, matrix multiply for the, uh, the cell, it will decide I'm going to instantiate the inner task twice, once to stage data from node memory into an aggregate local store, basically using all eight local stores together as a level of hierarchy. And then I'm going to run the inner kernel again to stage data from the aggregate local store into the individual local stores. And then I'll fire the leaf task to do you know, the little matrix multiply at that level. Um, and composite that back up. So both the number of times you unroll the inner tasks and what the tunable parameters are, basically the block sizes for each task, um, are set by the, uh, the auto-tuner. Um, and I'm going to skip over that. That's not so interesting. I will talk a little bit about this. So, it, so one of the goals of Sequoia was, was horizontal portability, which that last slide tried to show in lots of numbers. And this slide shows better um, in, in bar graphs. So, so a real problem with a lot of parallel programming languages today is you can write the program and it's functionally portable in the sense that you can take it and you can run it on machine A, machine B, machine C, and it works. But if it's tuned for machine A, you go to machine B and you get you know, one-tenth the performance you're expecting because it doesn't know what the cache sizes are in that machine. It isn't balanced for the, the ratio of computation to communication. Um, because Sequoia abstracts a lot of these details out, we're able to get very good performance running across a bunch of different machines. And this was a horizontal um, portability study where we went from an SMP, I think this was a Sun Niagara, basically a, a, a shared memory multiprocessor with cache, coherent caches, 
disc. Disc was a PlayStation 3 using the disc as main store. So it was an, basically doing an out of core computation using the same source code. Not a line was changed uh, to run out of the disc. A cluster of Pentium 4s, um, a, uh, a, a dual IBM cell board that, um, that we had on loan for a while, and a PlayStation 3, but this time using RAM as the top of the memory hierarchy rather than disc. What you see is that across all these different applications, we are either memory bandwidth limited, um, so basically that's um, idle waiting on um, the, the yellow chart here. I don't know why yellow doesn't show up in there. The yellow chart is basically waiting on memory bandwidth. The blue is, is um, running compute, and the red and white are overhead. And basically, um, there's almost no overhead. We're either memory bandwidth limited or we're compute limited, depending on which of these machine models we're on, on which benchmark. Um, a, a good view of that is if you look just at the IBM cell target, and, and run across these applications, you'll see that um, things like the gravity code, which is a, uh, a dense end body, um, everybody talks to everybody else, completely compute limited, right? Because it, it has a lot of arithmetic intensity. Um, the uh, the you know, SACSP and, and uh, the uh, um, uh, matrix vector here are completely memory limited. Somewhere in the middle is FFT, where you're roughly both. But in all cases, we are above the 90% line on either memory bandwidth or compute. We're limited by one or the other with very, you know, within 10% of the optimal we could have gotten had we gotten 100% out of the limiting resource. Um, and one of the ways we were able to do this was, was by using an auto-tuner. This was a, a student named Manman Ren's PhD thesis um, where we took a bunch of, of applications. The only real application here is actually SUMB, which is a fluid code that, that came out of Juan Alonzo's group in, in Aero and Astro. Um, the others are really benchmarks, but for all these cases, um, and, and there was no hand-tuned ones of this. A graduate student started on that, but they never finished um, the process of hand-tuning. And all of these, um, you know, the, the auto-tuned versions um, matched or in many cases um, handily beat the hand-tuned version because, it, it, quite frankly, it is better than a human at trying all possible blocking factors and all possible variants of the code and finding out which one works the best um, to do that, which is sort of what, what you want to do. You want to let the human think about how to decompose the problem let the compiler figure out what the parameters are. Um, so what about the future? This is actually the fun part of the talk, which I've only left myself uh, 13 minutes for. Um, so an interesting thing if you look at the future here, um, I don't know why that dotted red line is up where it was, um, but um, you know, CPUs are going at something less than 20% per year. This blue line, I think, is actually quite optimistic. Uh, we're actually out about here now. Um, and um, so if you, you are stuck in, is, with serial code, you're going to get very limited performance improvement. What you really want is to be on, on the green line um, there, you know, continuing to scale it at historic rates out into the future. Um, so I was recently part of a, of a DARPA study group um, looking at the challenges here. Basically, what does it take between where we are today to get to exascale computing? And I, I strongly encourage you to read this report. If you're at all interested in computer architecture, there's lots of interesting information here. It surveys all sorts of enabling technologies, what their current state is, what, what the, the blocking factors are. Um, it, it's, it's voluminous. A guy named uh, Peter Koji at, at Notre Dame was the, the principal author, and he actually did a, a tremendous job pulling together a lot of, of disparate information. I wrote a couple of the sections, but um, he did the lion's share of the work on this. Um, so if you go to the DARPA webpage and follow this link, um, it, it's a good read. It's got like 700 pages, so it might take you a little while. Um, but um, in, in the, the critical part of the report identifies what are the gaps? What don't we know how to do to get to, to building machines of, of, of an exaflop, basically 10 to the third beyond a petaflop? And, and it identified four challenges, the biggest one of which is, is this energy and power challenge. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the view is that basically, even if you assume a lot of very optimistic assumptions and you take current technology and extrapolate it forward, um, it's over 100 megawatts for an exaflop. In fact, if you're a little bit less generous on the assumptions, it's quite easy to convince yourself it's over a gigawatt. Um, and, and it's interesting because everybody says they want an, an exaflop, um, and if they really wanted it, they, they, they shouldn't, you know, pale at, at 100 megawatts. They just build a nuclear plant next to it and, and, and be done with it. Um, but they seem to want an exaflop for, for something like 20 megawatts. For some reason, that's kind of a threshold um, for a lot of them. So they conclude that this is a real um, blocking. It also, even at, at the you know, level of, of more modest systems, really constrains what we can put on a chip. Um, so, so how do we um, deal with this? energy and power challenge. Um, and and what, what really works well is, is to build a heterogeneous processor. 
where, you know, as much as I've been sort of dissing them this entire lecture, we do want a few of these denial processors. And, and the reason is that there are parts of your code where you're very concerned uh, about turnaround. And actually, a classic example of this, um, and part of it is, is with legacy. I think that the importance of these will diminish over time. But even in our mobile devices, one thing that's very, very concerning to us is, is a, uh, a, a major factor in user satisfaction is how quickly you load a web page. And when you look at, at the code for these web page, pages, you, you have all this JavaScript and stuff, and that is serial code. And I as much as you know, people will need to rewrite it in parallel, it's going to take a while for that to happen. And so for a very brief period of time, you want to power up these, these monstrously inefficient processors and let them crunch away at the serial code to get that serial stuff out of the way. And then for the interesting stuff that's actually going on, playing the video or, or rendering the, the you know, high fidelity 3D graphics that's going on, you want the hundreds to thousands of throughput processors to kick in and provide you know, a, a way more compelling visual experience than you can get with a few latency optimized processors on the same power. Question? Agreed that decoding the video can be made, made efficient, but I'm not seeing you know, the Java problem map to a scientific computing problem necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that you have to sort of um, look, look at it in the broad sense. And, and one way I look at it is that anything which takes a lot of time, takes a lot of time because you are operating on a larger data set. Uh, typically not because you're, you, you have a lot of control complexity. And if you're operating on a larger data set, there's almost always a way to decompose it um, wh wh where if you cannot do everything completely in parallel, you can do it with at least a log time reduction over that data set and, and move forward. Um, it's, it's a great example of this. Um, Alan Perlis, um, who you know, used to teach computer science at, at Yale for many years, um, used to have students write a compiler in APL, which is a great way uh, to understand you know, how to take something that you think of as being serial, like parsing. And actually, it's a parallel operation, because you can basically view a vector of words going into a set of, of operators that, that define a grammar. And what comes out actually is, um, is the, you know, the parsed ASTs of, of the uh, of the language. So many things you think of as being serial, you're thinking of that way because that's the way you've historically written the program for it. There are very few things that take a lot of time that, that aren't at the very roots mapping some function to a set of objects, and that's a parallel operation. Um, but let, me, let me move on here. Um, if you want to get thousands of processors, they have to have very simple control, um, in order, multi-threaded, um, in order because out-of-order execution, speculation, branch prediction, all those things that make the single-threaded cores fast make them very inefficient, which means we can't run thousands of them on our chip if we put those in. Um, and one thing we can do is if we do have data parallelism, exploit that by, by using SIMT parallelism. And it's a really nice feature of the GPUs that you can write your code with a very nice abstract threaded model. Every thread can do its own thing. But when you do have synergies, when lots of threads are doing the same thing, we can save energy by fetching an instruction once and using it multiple times. Um, something that we need to evolve is to make our memory systems much more agile. By agile, I mean giving the programming system more control over the placement of data. Shared memory is a nice start, but we need to move beyond that so we can have multiple levels of hierarchy being managed in very efficient ways by, by a combination of the compiler and system software. Um, there's also a bunch that we can do to, to um, close this energy gap. By the way, the energy gap is somewhere between 5 and 10x if you basically extrapolate where we are today and where we need to be. It's a 5 or 10x reduction in energy per op um, that we need to realize beyond what technology is going to give us by just scaling the, the semiconductor technology. Um, and um, one of the big things we can do here is use better circuits to move the, the data around. It turns out um, that moving you know, data around as a chip that I showed you is, is uh, somewhere between 200 and 400 femtojoules per bit millimeter. That, that translates into that, whatever it was per 64-bit word millimeters multiplied by uh, by 64, I guess 25 uh, picojoules. Um, but that's because we're basically sending the data by sending a 1 as the supply voltage and a 0 as ground. And that's kind of wasteful. We can, we can use much lower swings. We can use more efficient ways of signaling a bit across the chip. And, and there's potential for big reduction in, in the cost of data movement there. Um, part of the power challenge is really um, the, the locality part of the concurrency and locality challenge. And um, the, the Agile... Um, memory hierarchy can um, help that a lot. Um, we also want the ability to move data up and down through this, this storage hierarchy. Um, yet another part of it, um, which is not in our GPUs currently, is the ability to move computation to data. And you want to do this for two reasons. 
Um, the first is very often you have applications where there's highly contended data. Um, and when you have a highly contended piece of data, typically the, the profile is you reach out for the lock for that data. And you know, assuming you're lucky nobody else has a lock, you grab the lock, bring it back, um, set it locked, put it back so the next person can't lock it. Um, and that's done in, in some atomic fetch and op or, or, uh, or compare and swap operation. But it requires a traversal of the machine out and back and out again to, to acquire the lock. Um, and then once you've acquired the lock, you reach across the machine and grab the data, pull it back, operate on it, put it back where it was, and then you release the lock. And so you're a minimum of six traversals of the machine um, for this critical section of this highly contended variable. Whereas what you'd like to do is send the computation to the data, not the other way around. Send, I want to do you know, some atomic operation on this highly contended piece of data. After the long latency, which is traversing the machine, it arrives there, acquires a lock, locks it, operates on the data, releases a lock, all in 10 or 20 cycles, and then sends the result back. So the critical section has zero traversals of the machine wrapped around it, rather than, than six. And each of these traversals can be many hundreds of clock cycles. Um, the other reason you want to move computation to data is sometimes you have spatial locality without having temporal locality. That is, you have no reuse. You touch every piece of data exactly once, but you touch many pieces of data that are near one another. And in this case, you don't want to be dragging all the data all the way across the machine to touch each piece of it once. You're much better off sending your computation over to the data and having it then walk across all the data locally and sending some reduced result um, back to you. Um, the, um, the programming system needs to abstract all these things so that, you, so that you know, the, the shared memory, the explicit hierarchy, and the ability to specify which threads want to be located near which data need to be evolved in there. We have this in CUDA today. These are not there. And particularly the affinity in places is calling out to be put in there right now. Um, in CUDA, there's a very flat view of memory outside of, of shared. And that there's no view that any one uh, bank of, of memory is closer to any one um, system uh, or any one um, SM. And especially in a multi-GPU system, that's not the case. If you have a multi-GPU system, the different GPUs have their own memory. And so you wind up writing separate CUDA programs on them and having, having uh, explicit ways of moving back and forth. Um, another big part of the, of the challenge is concurrency. Um, if you look at, I was actually at a, at a DOE meeting in Chicago yesterday, and, and we were talking about how many threads you would need to fill an exascale machine, and I think the number we were coming up with was 25 billion. Um, because you, you, you're going to wind up with many hundreds of thousands of cores, and then we were talking about needing something on the order of 32 to 64 threads per core to hide the latency. Um, and so you need 25 billion threads. Well, if you're going to have 25 billion threads, and you don't want your problem to have to be enormously large. You want each thread to be very small. You want each thread to be perhaps you know, just a few tens of instructions, maybe even just a few instructions. And to do that, you need very efficient mechanisms to create threads, to have um, threads synchronize on, on an event with the availability of data, a barrier, um, some, some other um, event. And you need to have um, ways of, of passing d uh, data explicitly between threads very quickly. We refer to these as mechanisms, um, basically the things you provide in the hardware that the programming system can build on to build you know, thread management, communication, and synchronization. Um, and then you need to have those mechanisms accessible by a, a very productive programming environment, basically what CUDA is going to look like evolve forward. Um, so what um, I, I sketched, and this is actually almost the same slide I showed the DOE people yesterday, um, is, is what an uh, NVIDIA Exascale machine might look like in 2017. And I have to say might. This is not a committed roadmap, a lot of things can happen between now and 2017. But if you extrapolate what we'll be able to do in, in, in sort of the technology we, we have then, which will probably be about, um, you, know, you know, somewhere be either 14 nanometer or 10 nanometer technology, depending on quite where we, we hit the uh, technology curve, um, we'll be able to put um, about 2,500 cores on the chip, each with about three floating point units. And we'll also put 16 of these big fat um, inefficient CPUs on there. Um, and this will give us 40 teraflops of single precision, um, 13 teraflops of double precision. And that 3 to 1 ratio is actually a pretty natural ratio. Um, we, we uh, you know, with Fermi, we're 2 to 1. But 3 to 1 actually, for a number of reasons, actually makes, makes the machine come out a little bit more balanced. Um, there'll be a deep explicit on-chip storage hierarchy, and it will be agile in the sense that um, you'll be able to configure it. So some of it is explicitly managed storage. Some of it is going to be cache. And for the part that's cache, you can configure the cache so you have one big L2 that spans the whole chip for data structures that benefit by having one big level of working set. 
And for other data structures that have hierarchical reuse, the classic example here is, is, is DGEM, where basically repeatedly blocking it reduces the, um, the reuse, you'll make it deep, maybe even four or five levels deep by configuring the same memory at the same time. Part of the address space will look like a deep tree. Part of the address space will look like one big flat cache. Um, um, we'll have um, very fast communication and synchronization, so we'll be able to um, do small threads and have them cooperate with one another um, hierarchically. Oh, the memory's not that interesting. And you just start adding this up. You get a cabinet, um, which the thermal engineers look at me cross-eyed when I say 100 kilowatts, but we're at 50 today. So now they ought to be able to do 2x while we're doing like 10x. Um, and uh, um, those will connect up with um, a, a dragonfly network, which is a, a topology we described in ISCA a year ago um, with active optical cables. Um, a really interesting problem on this, and it's actually one of the challenges I didn't spend much time talking about, is, is uh, making sure these systems actually run long enough to do useful work. Um, on an exaflop system like this, depending on you know, whose numbers you look at for projections of soft error rates, it will have many soft errors per second. Um, basically bits flipping, and the bits will be flipping in the logic as well as the memory. In fact, um, the DRAM, because there's actually a lot of energy behind each DRAM bit, um, is one of the least susceptible things to flipping. It's the on-chip SRAM and the logic um, that, that's the most susceptible. And so the first thing you have to realize is that if you're, if you're taking many events per, per second, is you have to mask most of them. You cannot deal with rollbacks and stuff on a many per second basis. We're going to have to mask the vast majority of all errors. Um, so that means ECC on all memory and all links, and that actually lops uh, the number of errors down to where you're getting maybe a, you know, one every couple minutes. Um, and then um, for the ones that, that you are getting, um, you know, maybe even a couple, couple hours, the ones you're getting on that level, you at least need to detect all the errors. And it turns out that detecting errors and correcting them for, for things that just move bits is easy. You know, links move bits in space, memory moves bits in time. It's easy to use error, error uh, checking and correcting codes um, to, to take care of those errors. For things that compute, it's much harder. Um, and um, the, the option we're looking at here is exactly the option that's implemented in Merrimack, was you have either the ability to pair cores. So if you say, this is important and I don't know how to self-check it, it will take two cores and run them simultaneously. Now you might think that this is very wasteful, that it's using twice as much of your resource. But realize the expensive resource is moving things around. And because it's doing them simultaneously, it only needs to move the instructions and data once feed them to both cores, compare the results. And so you're spending the arithmetic twice, but you're only spending the data movement once, and the data movement was the expensive thing energy-wise. So it's actually a very efficient way of doing computation. We're also working on, it's not in the bullets here, we're working on an API for resilience that will let you do two things. One is it will let you specify what code you want to run in this self-checking mode, and what code you say, I'll check it myself. Because there's a bunch of code that you can do where it's very easy to check the result you invert a matrix. It's relatively easy compared to that inversion to multiply it by the original matrix and see if you get the identity matrix within a fuzz factor um, out. Um, the other thing the API does is it lets you specify what data to checkpoint when. Um, especially for, for certain implicit codes, the amount of data that actually needs to be preserved, the amount of data from which you can recompute the whole state of the application is less than 10% of, of the entire state. And so um, it, rather than having a checkpoint naively checkpoint the entire state, we want to have this, um, this API be able to say, protect this state. This is the state everything else gets computed from. And by the way, do it at these points in time, because that's at the beginning of the time step. Now, it won't do it at every beginning of the time step, but each time it's given an opportunity, it will look at its sort of optimization um, number for how often it wants to checkpoint. Say, OK, I'm going to checkpoint now, and it will save just that state. And then you register the procedure, which basically, if you take an error, rolls you back, and from that state recreates and restarts um, the computation. And so that, that basically makes um, doing a checkpoint restart, which is basically the way you deal with the errors you, you discover from this pairing of cores or, or unrecoverable errors on the links and memories, um, very efficient. So I have run over, I apologize. Um, let, me, let me wrap up very, very quickly, and I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, to stick after and answer, answer questions, but I do want to let people go who, uh, who have things they need to get to. Um, so um, single thread performance is no longer scaling. It's a fact. Deal with it. Don't be in denial about that. Um, because of that, we need to really look at where um, performance and efficiency comes from in our system. And all performance comes from parallelism. There's no other way to get performance. You can either get your parallelism up front and legitimately, or you can get it in the closet. I mean, if you look at what you know, sort of these complex out-of-order CPUs are doing, they're getting parallelism, but they're putting instruction-level parallelism under the covers. 
Um, and we need to get locality. And again, we can get it by trying to get it under the covers via caches, or we can get it um, by being explicit about it and managing the hierarchy. And actually, you want to do both of those. Um, the good news is applications have lots of parallelism and lots of localities. This would be a great earthquake detector. Um, and uh, you know, co contrary to, to, the, to this guy at Ars Technica who argues that everything is serial, it's not. There, there's lots of parallelism in the world. Um, to exploit the parallelism locality, you need lots of cores and exposed storage hierarchy and a programming system that abstracts this. Um, we're, we're already doing a, a pretty good job of this today, you know, sh shipping chips that um, you know, have, have you know, 512 cores, you know, one and a half teraflops of, of single and roughly, roughly half of that of double. Um, but getting from where we are today to building you know, machines with, with 10 to the 18th flops uh, requires quite a bit more. Um, in, in particular, we've got this 5 to 10x energy gap to close. And that's going to be a big challenge for us to do. We have to take, you know, I think we have a leg up because we're building cores that are 200 picojoules per instruction rather than cores that are 2 nanojoules per instruction. But we need to build cores that today would be um, 20, uh, 20 picojoules per instruction. So when we scale them to 10 nanometer, they're going to be 6 or 7. And that's going to be hard. Um, part of doing that is going to be basically managing our memory hierarchy in a much more clever way. We need to build much more energy efficient cores. We already have simple control. We need to make it simpler. We need to optimize our data movement um, within the cores. We need to optimize our, our communications. And part of the communications is circuit optimizations. We need to reduce the joules per bit millimeter. That's a big number and, and it's, it's going to be dominant because you know, as we scale our technology, the energy of the core scales. It just scales by a factor of two instead of a factor of eight. The energy of the communications doesn't scale. It's, uh, you know, 200 femtojoules per bit millimeter now, and it's going to be 200 femtojoules per bit millimeter in 10 nanometer. And, and basically, as everything else scales down, that's going to wind up sticking up on top. Um, and we need a efficient parallel mechanisms, because when we have 24 billion threads, they better be small, or our data set's going to be really big. Um, but it's really an exciting time to be in computing, because uh, it's interesting. I was talking to the DOE people, and they said, this is a really exciting time to be in computing at the National Lab, because it's just like the early 90s, when we were all moving off of these vector machines, onto the clusters of microprocessors. And, and it completely changed our programming model. And we were able to solve problems much bigger than we had solved before. And it was a, a paradigm shift. And I say, you know, this is an even more exciting time than that because it's not just taking place in the national labs, right? It's taking place in the whole world of computing. Um, everybody, if they want to deliver more value in their applications, needs more performance to do it. And that performance isn't coming on the serial side. It's all coming on the parallel side. And so the whole world is flipping from a serial programming model to a parallel programming model. And Today, the most common platform for uh, parallel programming is, is an NVIDIA GPU. We have over you know, 150 million parallel um, systems you know, shipped CUDA-enabled GPUs in, in operation. And there's actually over 1,000 clusters um, with 100 or more GPUs um, in them. Um, and, and CUDA is, is the most prevalent parallel programming language in the world today, taught at over 300 universities, um, you know, widely used by, um, by lots of programmers. So you guys are getting in, if not on the ground floor, at least at the first landing, on what is really you know, a revolution in, in computing that's taking place, you know, not just in the scientific computing realm, but, you know, from mobile devices um, to, you know, desktop productivity applications on up. So that's uh, all I have. Thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.